Creme 2 News begins now. Thank you for joining us on Creme 2 Plus. I'm Tim Pham. This is your Creme 2 News Week in Review. Join us as we take a closer look at some of the biggest stories in the Inland Northwest this past week. Well, the Cub here on WSU's campus is now open for anyone needing a place to get warm. But just down the road in Moscow, the other university on the Bluse wasn't so lucky. Things are fairly quiet on the University of Idaho campus, closed due to the natural gas leak that started four miles north of Pullman Wednesday. It's very stressful because we're getting towards the end of the year, but the campus just wants us to be safe and not have to take class in no heating. Williams pipeline crews are working to fix the broken pipe and a Vista crews are working in multiple towns to manually shut off the gas so the line can be purged. Still, it's having a chilling impact on businesses, schools and city offices. It's going to take a while but apparently much faster than what we were hearing last night. When we Avista's latest estimate for natural gas restoration is three to five days. They have a mutual aid, which indeed means uh, additional gas companies that can come in and help. On WSU's campus, a backup source is keeping some buildings warm, but some students weren't prepared. <laughs> no, definitely no. not. For this test of their winter fortitude. <laughs> yeah. It's going to be fun. <laughs> Caitlin, Lily, and Ava didn't think much of the alerts they got Wednesday at first. Hey, we tried to go to Chipotle, and everything was shut down, like all the restaurants, everything, and we were kind of confused, but then we all put it together when the dorms didn't have any. But the cold shower Thursday morning sure woke them up. It was a surprise. Yeah. <laughs> it was definitely a shock, <laughs> yeah. While many wait for the heat to come back on, Pullman's allowing anyone to warm up at the Cub on campus and Avista is providing heaters. So we're not going to get down into the 20s, we're in the 30s, so it's not going to be that critical. Now Mayor Johnson says that the priority has been given to hospitals, schools and public buildings to get the heat back on. But uh, getting that restoration of the natural gas, well, depending on who gets that first, it's kind of up in the air because that all depends on which lines can be turned on at which time. In Pullman, Shannon Mowdy, Crumb 2 News. Last night, two candidates claimed they hoped they would be the next mayor of Spokane, but we all know there can only be one. Today, I spoke to an American politics expert about the factors that can influence a candidate's confidence in winning an election. Election night results show Lisa Brown leads Spokane's mayoral race by less than 2,000 votes. Last night, she thanked the voters who gave her an early lead. It looks very good that many of you have trusted me to be the next mayor of Spokane. At the same time, Mayor Nadine Woodward was optimistic about her future as the leader of Spokane. I believe we're gonna make up those ballots. And I will be your next mayor. WSU political science professor, Dr. Cornell Clayton, says the mayor's claims are still valid even though she's behind in numbers. There are uh, lots of votes uh, that could determine the outcome and change the outcome as it appears on election night still out to, to be counted. He says there are some factors that could lead to a potential influx of votes in Woodward's favor. Democratic leaning uh, voters tend to cluster in urban areas where there's more drop boxes and drop boxes are used more frequently by them. Whereas uh, more rural voters who tend to skew Republican and conservative, uh, more often they mail their ballots to the, the regular post. Dr. Clayton also says voter trends show Democratic identifying voters are more likely to vote early and in off-year elections compared to Republican identifying voters. There are several factors that may come into play here. Over the last 50 years, only one Spokane mayor has been re-elected and served two terms in Spokane. Dr. Clayton says being the incumbent might not have as much influence as it would on a congressional level. There's always a mood, especially when there's economic concern, um, in the electorate to, to uh, vote against the, the party that's in power, to vote against the incumbents. Time will eventually tell if history repeats itself or if Spokane will have another two-term mayor. This is the Spokane County Election Office. I was here for Krem 2 News at noon, and when the news was first breaking, I saw firemen in hazmat suits walking in and out of the building and election workers standing outside wondering what was going on. This evening, we now know that the substance found in the envelope was fentanyl. 
Election workers were busy counting ballots a day after the election, but around 10 o'clock this morning, an employee opened an envelope and there was a white powdery substance in it. Spokane County Auditor Vicki Dalton says that was when the employee immediately told a supervisor the elections office was closed and the staff evacuated. Considering how long it was going to take to evaluate the substance, so we sent the employees home. The Spokane Police Department says initial tests showed the powdered substance tested positive for fentanyl, which is a potent synthetic opioid that can be deadly. In Spokane County, we have not had an interruption due to an evacuation in the time that I have been auditor. Dalton says the employee who found the substance was evaluated by medical experts but did not have symptoms. Everyone responded. Um, appropriately and quickly to this situation. Election manager Mike McLaughlin says it wasn't expected, but they were prepared for it. Something that we were aware of and there's protocols in place to handle this type of situation. Police say they're working with federal and state agencies to investigate. The envelope was not a ballot. It was just a white envelope just addressed to us. McLaughlin says this will not slow down when election results will be certified. The plan is to have the Secretary of State affirm results on November 28th. We did learn that there was a note inside the envelope, but we do not know what it says. And I'm told that we can expect a new election update tomorrow at 5 p.m. In Spokane, Nathan Hun, Crime 2 News. Spokane County Auditor Vicki Dalton says there has never been an interruption in ballot processing as a result of an evacuation in her 25 years as an auditor. Despite the temporary disruption, ballots were back to moving through the elections office today, as made evident by the results we just received. The gloves came on at the Spokane County Elections Office. Back to work as normal. We started at 8 o'clock. We're processing ballot envelopes. Spokane County Auditor Vicki Dalton says work continued Thursday as it would have Wednesday before the building was evacuated. Here on a table in the elections processing room, an employee opened an envelope to find a white powder. Spokane police later confirmed the powder tested positive for fentanyl. Immediately, everything in that area stops. Dalton says processing was halted for two hours. A handful of people were allowed back into the building to do signature verification to keep some of the work moving. With a 34 percent voter turnout before polls closed Tuesday, there are still potentially hundreds of thousands of votes left to be counted. Even though ballot processing resumed today, Dalton wants other offices to stay on alert. She says it's possible more powder will be mailed and found. In all likelihood, there will be more. And again, it's just it's really disturbing that an individual out there um, wants to disrupt our democracy and our elections. In addition to Spokane County, three other Washington elections offices were mailed envelopes with a white powder yesterday. Sending powder, whether it was harmful or not, to elections offices is very cowardly. It is disheartening. It's disrespectful to people who are truly working to keep democracy safe and functioning. Spokane police say they're working alongside state and federal investigators, including the FBI and U.S. Postal Inspection Service. The Associated Press reported powder was mailed to elections offices in Washington, California, Georgia, Nevada, and Oregon. The employee who opened the envelope yesterday was back at work today with no symptoms. As more results come in, the elections office says nothing is official until the Secretary of State affirms results. That's set to take place November 28th. In the newsroom, Janelle Finch, Crumpton News. In the mountains of North Stevens County, it's quiet except for the occasional, but it's here, by the chicken coop, where that quiet was literally ripped apart. The bear, when it came in and tore through here, it just tin canned the feed barrel and rolled it over actually about 10 feet from the house. Alexandra and Luke Davis are used to wildlife in these parts. We're used to the black bears coming in. But this disruption was something different. And this side of the coop was ripped off. He ripped that open and was getting chickens out of there. This was a grizzly bear. Grizzly bears, they just don't stop. Once they find something that they want, you, you don't just chase them off. The signs were all there. The coop and fence ripped apart, tracks around their property, 
When we started seeing tracks like that, that's when we really started locking down. But they still hadn't actually seen the grizzly. You didn't know where he was. The couple reached out to wildlife officials who set up cameras. And you can see right there the fence and the hog panel, the grizzly just pushing it down. Uh, he has chicken in his mouth. That's when it, like the mama bear and me comes out and I'm like, hey, this bear needs to be dealt with because that's too close. Wildlife officials set a trap and later that night. Uh, I heard the door slam shut and he started rocking and roaring and really raising the ruckus when uh, he got in there. Do you think the grizzly had any fear whatsoever? None. None. He, he was totally comfortable and just did what he wanted every, every time. He was definitely more than a nuisance. He was a threat and a danger. And um, it just it couldn't have that. I mean, the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife says they occasionally document grizzlies in northeast Washington. They're definitely here. But the people who live here say the signs are more than occasional. We know how many are out here. We have to deal with them. Grizzly bears used to live in most of Washington, but now they're endangered and only supposed to live in the Selkirk Mountains. So when they show up in yards like this... A lot of the people are, are afraid to speak out about any of it because they don't want to get in trouble because they're protected. The bear's protected, but the residents left exposed. You can only do so much against an animal that huge uh, and that fierce. And uh, you definitely don't put yourself between them and what they're going after. As the Davises settle into quiet winter. Spring's right around the corner. The threat of wildlife never goes away. Yeah, bracing for ourselves uh, for spring when they wake up and they know where spring. it's at. This is the tree that fell unexpectedly on Diane Williams' car, killing her instantly. This cross here marks the start of a memorial honoring the woman who meant a great deal to many. Seltis Way is a common route between Post Falls and Coeur d'Alene. But as Diane Williams drove this route Saturday morning, she encountered a threat no one expected. A tree from the median fell onto her car. It killed Diane instantly. Idaho State Police are still investigating what caused this, but the Coeur d'Alene Fire Department says there was no wind when the tree fell. As Diane's family and friends wait for answers, they're holding tightly to her memory. Truly a huge loss to our family, a great sister and a wonderful human being all her life. Diane's brother Tom Collins told me over the phone she moved to Post Falls from California six years ago. She dedicated her life to physical therapy and retired just a few years ago. She was the sister to six boys. She was my sister and my best friend. She gave everything she had to life, helping others. She will be missed tremendously. We will carry her legacy with us in our hearts forever. Rest in peace, my beautiful sister. I will miss you forever. Tom says Diane had a great love for dogs. Shortly after retiring, she started a dog sitting business, Diane's Dog House. She even shared her passion with a few young girls from the neighborhood, walking the dogs together at Atlas Mill Park. The median on Celtis Way is maintained by the city of Coeur d'Alene. City Administrator Troy Timison says its urban forestry program preserves, maintains, and enlarges the city's urban forest. But he says while these efforts can help minimize any danger from falling branches or trees, they cannot eliminate it entirely. Even healthy trees with no warning signs can come down under the wrong circumstances. Meantime, he says the city will continue inspecting its trees. Her brother also told me he is grateful that Diane didn't suffer long. Right now, her family is making arrangements for her funeral. Reporting in Coeur d'Alene, Amanda Rowley, Crumb 2 News. It was here in the city council chambers that last night's city council meeting got abruptly canceled. Why? The interim city council president cited open forum violations by people in this room. Today, I got the chance to look into the rules and get reaction. Free, free Palestine. Free, free Palestine. Dozens of pro-Palestine protesters crowded the city council chambers to voice their opinion during the meeting's open forum. Thank you for your time. 
People were speaking out about their opinions regarding the council's resolution acknowledging Israel's right to exist and to defend itself. How dare you sit idly funding, funneling money into the inhumane actions of the apartheid state of Israel. The open forum was going as usual until... Council member Bingo calls point a point of order. of order. Speakers began addressing specific council members by name, which is not allowed. It was getting to the point where almost every speaker was getting interrupted for violating the rules. Council member Zach Zapone says there were multiple attempts to stop the interruptions. When people were interrupting, talking over each other and shouting and chanting in the audience, no one can be heard and no one can have it. Once it became clear people weren't following the rules, interim city council president Lori Kinnear adjourned the meeting. Shut the meeting down. As you can see here, city council meeting rules say people must address the city council president during an open forum and not any other individual. I did not want to stop the meeting. I wanted us to keep going forward. Council members Jonathan Bingle does not agree with the meeting rules. He says people should have the right to speak up to their elected officials without limitations. Citizens have every right to show up to our meetings and to speak to their governing body to speak to any one of us. I would encourage that. In a statement from Kinnear, she says, quote, legislative session is a space where council conducts legislative business in a transparent process that includes the public. It is essential that council hears testimony on items concerning city business. Council rules exist to ensure that testimony unfolds in a fair and orderly manner and that the environment in council chambers encourages a full range of respectful discourse. In Spokane, Nathan Hyun, Krem 2 News. With our first snow already in the books, now's a great time to talk winter. El Nino is in full effect, changing weather patterns all over the world. What might mean a warmer, drier winter for us means more rain in other parts of the world. El Nino means warm sea surface temperatures all the way down in the equatorial Pacific. You can see that's us right over there. That slight bump in temperatures causes some major changes in the atmosphere overhead. It causes the jet stream to split overhead, so the Arctic jet then moves north and east, taking all the bitter cold along with it. The Pacific jet then dives to the south. What that does is it brings all of the storms right into California, taking with it the storms and all the snow and rain we would see across much of the inland northwest. The average temperature in Spokane in the dead of winter hovers pretty close to freezing, so a small bump in temperature might not mean less snow overall, but what it might mean is that the snow that falls might melt a little quicker here in town, and some of the ponds that you want to skate on might not freeze over deep enough. All right, bud, so in the mountains and areas a little bit farther off to the north, a small bump in temperatures isn't enough to make a huge difference. So what's more likely is an average amount of snow that lasts through much of the winter. Remember when we were talking storm track back in the classroom? Hey, you're not listening. Hey, you're not listening. Some of California's biggest rain and snow years for Southern California were during El Nino. Some of our driest, they were as well. Milder temperatures in a more west to east or zonal storm track would actually mean that places like the Columbia Basin or in central Washington would see a lot less snow on the ground and throughout the entire winter. Kind of the same reason we wind up seeing a very similar or normal amount of snow in the mountains. El Nino's greatest impacts typically take place between October and March, meaning we could see another mild spring, much like what we saw this past year. If that happens, that melts off all that mountain snowpack really quick, taking away beneficial stream flow and groundwater. Thankfully for us, buddy, the statistical correlation between El Nino winters and a lack of snow in Spokane isn't strong enough that we have to worry about missing out here or in the mountains. Now there are other atmospheric patterns that happen on a smaller scale as well, like the Madden-Julian oscillation, which would essentially give us more snow and cold so we don't miss out on winter here in the inland northwest. Ham, 
Hey, are you listening to any of this? Let's just go outside. Come on. For more than 20 years, Vicki Dalton has served as Spokane County's auditor. She's in charge of elections, making sure they're accurate and secure. It's a process. It's all a process, and it's all about controls. With more than 300,000 registered voters in Spokane County, it is a huge task with zero margin for error. Dalton says their system of collecting, sorting, and counting ballots is proven to work. How confident are you that if these steps are followed correctly, that the results of the election are accurate? We have done so many recounts over the years that have shown that our results are accurate. As the ballots come into the office, they're taken out of the return envelope. Then, while still in the security envelope, they're sent through this machine that scans a barcode, sorts them by precinct, and snaps a picture of each signature. You'll see all those monitors, and those monitors are where people are comparing the signature in the voter registration record to the signature that's on the envelope. If the signatures match, the ballots are removed from the security envelope and are prepared to be counted. If there's an issue with the signature or the voter forgot to sign the envelope, the elections office will contact the voter with how to move forward, a process called curing. And so they go into these trays right here. The ballots are then inspected and placed into these red trays, again sorted by precinct, before being sent to a secure room to be counted. So those trays on racks will go into that room and then they'll go through the door behind to go into the tabulation. And all of those doors are locked and sealed, and there's a number right there. The tabulation room sits behind locked doors. Those doors require key cards from two authorized people to open, and a red tab similar to a zip tie tells workers if the doors have been opened. Anyone who enters the room must sign in. Everything is tracked. Why take all the steps to ensure security, like placing a lock on each door? because we want to know if anything has happened. For one, it's a deterrent. It keeps people from trying anything. Two, if something does happen, then we know it has happened. Since it's a secure room, we can't show you where the ballots are tabulated, but Vicki says think of it like a large scanner. It's not Wi-Fi enabled, so it can't be hacked, and it's not part of any outside network, so it can't be breached. State law dictates that election workers can process the ballots before election night as they come in, but they can't hit that tabulate button to see the results until 8 p.m. on election night. And speaking of election night, those initial results are by no means final. Election night results are not the final results. In fact, traditionally, or based on historical numbers, what we release on election night represents only about 50% of the total ballots that we will receive and count by the time we certify the election two to three weeks after election day. Dalton is now in her seventh and final term as auditor. She tells me their system of collecting, sorting, and counting ballots works well and that voters should have confidence in the results. I think vote by mail is an excellent system and an excellent process. It is safe, it is secure, and we are able to produce accurate results that are truly the votes of the people. One thing for sure, there were a lot of excited students here today at Logan Elementary. I got a chance to see that up close firsthand right inside of those doors because hundreds of children had a positive impact on their life today. Perfect timing, of course, because of all the rain, all of the weather, that cool weather that has been recently coming in. You should have seen it. The Spokane firefighters were here getting them sized up, getting them ready and letting them know that there's people right here in the community that are thinking about them, letting them know that they're not without a helping hand nearby. So go ahead and take a listen right now because I got a chance to speak with those firefighters about why they feel it's important. But there's a there's a big need for it. I think, you know, a large majority of the schools here in Spokane are considered Title I schools. Um, so uh, to be able to get out and help these kids out, um, it takes one more thing off their plate. You know, as a kid, you shouldn't be worried about, you know, staying warm at recess or when you're playing with your friends after school. Um, if we can remove that worry for them and, and just let them be kids, then that's a pretty pretty good feeling. And yeah, these firefighters have been doing this for the last decade. They've passed out thousands 
of coats at this point and they're only going to continue to do that and continue to make sure that kids here in our community are nice and warm when they go to places like school. But for now, reporting in Spokane, Brandon T. Jones, Crim2 News. Thank you for joining us here on Crem2 Plus for a look at some of the biggest news stories of the past week. For the most current news throughout the weekend, you can watch our latest newscast right here on Crem2 Plus. Just look for them in the bottom navigation menu. I'm Tim Pham. Thanks for watching.